New Bluetooth flaws have been found, the USPS used vulnerable systems for years, and Votes wants to make it harder for you to do your job. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings! I am Shannon Morse and this is ThreatWire for September 15, 2020. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. I've got a few announcements, including a giveaway you will probably be interested in, so don't skip this part. I am still offering that 15% discount for annual Patreon memberships, since that option is now available. Current patrons can also switch to take advantage of that discount still. Also, the monthly Patreon streams are happening today, so so check the Patreon page for details. Also, 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 I am giving away three Wi-Fi Pineapple Mark 7s in my unboxing and setup video, which is posted over on my tech YouTube channel. So the link is down in the description. All you have to do is comment and subscribe on that YouTube channel. And lastly, but definitely not least, the Hack Shop is now giving patrons of ThreatWire on Patreon a membership discount. So if you are a ThreatWire Patreon member, you will now have different discounts that happen all the time for the hack shop and those will only be available for patrons and now on to the news Bluetooth is one of those standards that security conscious folks like me will tell you to keep disabled and this is a new discovery that just adds to that reasoning. According to a statement released by the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, which is a global community of companies that innovate on Bluetooth performance and security, two different groups of researchers have found vulnerabilities that affect Bluetooth 4.2 all the way up through 5.0. The research comes out of EPFL and Purdue University, where both groups were able to independently verify these issues. The problem stems from the cross-transport key derivation or CTKD with pairing and encryption in Bluetooth BR and EDR, as well as Bluetooth LE. Now these standards are used in devices such as Bluetooth speakers, wireless headphones, fitness bands, watches, and Bluetooth keyboards, just to name a few. The vulnerability can allow an attacker to attempt privilege escalation between two transports with non-authenticated encryption keys, replacing the authenticated keys, along with weaker encryption keys, replacing the stronger ones. Now, the Bluetooth SIG is calling this Blurtooth with CVE 2020-15802. It is a completely new unpatched vulnerability too, so it potentially affects hundreds of millions of devices worldwide. According to the notice, for an attack to be successful, the attacker would need to be within wireless range of a vulnerable Bluetooth device that uses CTKD and permits pairing on either of the vulnerable Bluetooth specifications with no authentication or no user control access restrictions. The spoofing device must get paired on the transport and CTKD must be used to overwrite any pre-existing keys, which will give the attacker access to take actions like man-in-the-middle attacks. Bluetooth SIG is working with manufacturers to implement restrictions to CTKD mandated in 5.1 and higher versions of Bluetooth standards, and they also recommend device owners restrict when their devices are in pairing mode and update to the newest firmware patches available. According to a memorandum sent by the Office of the Inspector General for the United States Postal Service, sent to the size OVP and the IT VP for the USPS, outdated IT systems have been used for years by the Postal Service that could have cost a, quote, potential financial impact of over $1 billion, and that was B as in beta. Now, while some of the memo is redacted, it explains that these issues came to their attention after doing an ongoing audit and they require immediate attention and remediation. The vulnerabilities found were not directly related to the scope of this audit, but they warranted that immediate action. The memo states that the USPS allowed six of 10 applications, four of which were deemed sensitive, to operate even though they had significant vulnerabilities for upwards of seven years without a complete certification and accreditation process. Now this means the applications were running without a mitigation plan, no risk acceptance letters, no approval signatures, or expired conditional accreditation letters. Under the Postal Service policies, approvals are required
required before deploying any kind of new resources. And if requirements cannot be met, a failure to comply letter must be issued. And one of those was not issued either. The policies also require the processes to be reinitiated every one to three years. So the report states that these vulnerabilities could lead to disclosure of sensitive data and unauthorized access by potential attackers. 12 vulnerabilities were found with a potential impact of over that $1 billion. The specific vulnerabilities were not disclosed, but the memo does state that these are common and they could be exploited using publicly available methods by an attacker. Because of the memorandum, the USPS planned to provide an update before July 30th. 31st, 2020, which they did so, and according to the reports, the issues were addressed, and at this time there is no evidence of these vulnerabilities ever being used in the wild. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my supporters at patreon.com slash threatwire. Check out these amazing new fur baby photos from my hush puppy perk level patrons. They are totally awesome for sending them in. I love them so much. Keep them coming. Also, if you have not seen the action alerts that I have been posting on the page, I've gotten some great feedback from many of the patrons who have said that they have used these alerts to harden their own network security. That's great news. It's exactly the reason why I wanted to start doing those action alerts. So you can always see all of the alerts on the Patreon page by searching action alerts. My patrons chose this story via our weekly story poll. A briefing filed to the Supreme Court states that votes, that's spelled V-O-A-T-Z, they're a Boston-based e-voting company, which is commonly used by active military to cast ballot votes while overseas and also used in 11 states, is arguing that security researchers should not have legal protection whenever they are looking for vulnerabilities within a company's infrastructure without express permission. Yes, you heard that right. Even though we have seen many flaws in voting company hardware and software through sources such as the Voting Machine Village at DEF CON, even though another company called ESNS has started asking hackers to find vulnerabilities, this company only wants you hacking them if they give you permission. Votes argues that running live attacks on live, real-life systems would give researchers faulty results and conclusions, and it would make it hard to distinguish between, quoting them, true researchers and malicious hackers, and would create unnecessary burdens. Yeah. Okay, so now in February, Votes also had an argument with MIT researchers who found a bunch of vulnerabilities in their mobile voting software, which is used in those 11 different states currently. Votes said in their briefing that the MIT researchers' findings were rendered useless because they did not use the authorized bug bounty program or directly collaborate with the company. I just, does anybody else, does, does votes honestly think that malicious hackers are going to ask for permission to hack their software? Like they won't take vulnerability seriously unless they go through their bug bounty program? Dude, I, okay. I feel like the MIT researchers really did them a big favor here. To continue, Votes also reported a University of Michigan student who was enrolled in a class that required studying flaws in online voting to state officials when said student found a flaw in their software. They just, I feel like they just really aren't fans of constructive criticism, are they? Meanwhile, the DHS has requested that researchers try to find vulnerabilities in election infrastructure since the work is critical to national security. This all matters because votes filing in the Supreme Court is a broader reconsideration of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986, which is very vague, obviously, allowing for researchers to be criminalized if they find and report vulnerabilities without going through channels that are deemed appropriate by the target of the research. Votes does not want the CFAA narrowed to ensure ethical hacking is decriminalized. Not only is this a bad look for votes, but their filing could potentially keep security researchers from being able to report findings without that fear of legal action against them. Malicious actors, they don't wait for permission. Just FYI, votes. <laughs> Before I leave, I wanna say thank you so much to the amateur, Mark H. Fluffy Draco, 
Buffy Draco. Hmm. Dobe, Chudi N, Nunction, Will B, John P, Gary A, Kevin C, obviously Ace, Charlie P, Ryan C, Kevin R, and Brandon C, who joined the Patreon team this week. Thank you so much to each and every one of you. You are amazing and I appreciate you. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I'm Shannon Morris and I will see you on the internet.